Stefan Sembrovich with Brian Morelli, and it's the 14th of February, 2014. I had to think for a minute then, Brian. I know. At my it, age. It slips by quickly, doesn't time it? Time slips past. Mm. And we're in Bristol Carl showroom in Kensington. Brian, how did you first get, get involved with Bristol Cars? It was a love for my father and I had for motor cars generally, and father was in the trade. Went to see Mr. Crook one day in Hersham with a view to purchase and a demonstration of a Fiat, and we went out for the test, and one thing led to another. My father said, is there a space for my son? What age were you? 16, and just, just 16. And Mr. Crook said, glad to have him aboard. It'd be delightful. Richard, how did you first become involved with Bristol Cars? Well, as a small boy, I was a great car enthusiast, and we lived not very far from what was then Anthony Crook Motors, the biggest Bristol distributor. And I used to cycle past on my bicycle and look in through the window. And one day when my father was thinking of buying himself a decent second car, I suggested he went down and had a look, yes. which he did, and he purchased in 1955 a second-hand 400 from the late Mr. Anthony Crook, right. which he loved, and later on it was part exchange for a 405 drophead, which we drove all over Europe on holidays, and um, well, I've been associated ever since. Some years after that, when my father was part exchanging a Humber Super Sniper State car yes. for a 406, there was some discussion as to whether the wireless should be swapped over free or charge or not. And um, my father said, I can't spend too much money today because my son's about to leave school and he doesn't have a job. Right. So it was decided that my father would be blindfolded and Mr. Crook would be blindfolded and they would walk along the painted red carpet in the middle of the showroom and whoever got the furthest would no doubt win. And my father managed it by about 18 inches and uh, the wireless was swapped over free of charge yes. and I started in the stores the following Monday on two shillings an hour. So I joined in uh, 59 and the new car then was the, f the uh, 406 yes. with the 2.2. Then we went to the 407 which was the first of the V8s. Still with the, s the body shape was as the 406 which was an attractive shape. Did you, uh, were you aware of the discussions prior to the choice of the V8? Were you in, in, involved? I, in no, I was, I was too young and yeah, knew, yeah, and knew all, but I did hear latterly, latter days about what they tried. They tried to develop another engine um, to get the extra performance, but the cost was prohibitive. And of course, John Dennis was running the workshop at the time, who was Tony, Mr. Crook's racing mechanic in yes. all the years um, with the hill climbs, the circuits, racing, and everything that he, he taught me everything I know, really, yes. about that side of things. It was Anthony Crook Motors as it was then, yes. But when we dealt with Fiat and Arbath, Simca, um, and AC, of course, which was another insight because John Dennis used to prepare all the 100 D2 engines, the sports engines that were fitted to the ACs down in Thames, didn't um, So he was, he was responsible for the preparation of the engines for AC. Yes, just when the 110 engine was that's coming it. out. That's it, yes, that's yeah. right. But these, these were the 100 Ds that they put in the AC. Uh, although they did use the 110 in the um, fixed top, the Greyhound. That was it. The Greyhound had the 110 engine. Um, and then things progressed. Um, it was a huge premises down at Hersham, um, a big sales uh, area. We, we sold Bristol's primarily, but we were also the Arbath concessionaire for the UK. Yes. Uh, we were Fiat distributors for Surrey and Zagato. 
by that stage, uh, it was really only the 407 Zagato that was left. All the 406 Zagatos had been delivered. Yes. And the number of special bodied 400s. Oh, yes. Because um, Zagato did, did, did some 400s, didn't they? Yes, they did. Um, 400s were sent out in the 60s or late 50s for the Zagato body to be put on. Very, very similar to the 406 Zagato. We stayed there until about 64 at Hersham. Yes. Then we moved up to uh, this at Chiswick, um, the Chiswick Roundabout, um, which was a, a large premises. This was the time that Tony Crook was becoming uh, involved in management of Bristol cars. Very much so. And of course, Mr. Crook would fly from White Waltham to Filton on a weekly basis. Yes to um, see what was going on and to give advice. Took me in the plane a number of times oh. um, and also took me a number of times to collect cars that we may have purchased um, up the Isle of Wight or up, up in Scotland and I would drive them back and of course he would come back, he would fly back. I, w I always felt confident with him because he was very good at it but you know it's a tiny little machine and uh, we were icing up one day right. on the wings right. and he says I think we better drop the altitude a little bit so those sort of things make you think but uh, no I was always confident with him um, and he was very good generally to the staff and the people who work with him um, he had his moments it was always very enjoyable and very exciting. Um, he led very much from the front. Um, he never expected anybody in the sales department to do anything that he wouldn't do. Um, so his examples were, were always uh, excellent. Um, and um, he was very, very hard working and he expected a lot from his staff, which he got. So what are your best memories over all, over all the years? I think probably uh, one of the fondest memories was in 1964, when I mean, bearing in mind I'd only been with the company four or five years. Yes. I was in Cornwall with my parents and we had a horrendous car accident. Gosh. I lost my mother. I was seriously injured and I was in Truro Hospital from the May until October and Mr. Crook used to send my salary weekly by yes. recorded delivery. Yes, See this is the sort of thing that you don't forget these sort of things this is why yeah. you know it, it's, it was so and I bear in mind I'd only been with the company four years yes. and it, um, so I was paid all that time and I was always getting phone calls and when you're coming back and don't rush only when you're better um, and I suppose I rejoined. I just got back for my 21st birthday party. That was that was it. Then I started work the week after. He was a terrific salesman and a great motivator. Um, in fact, the greatest motivator I think I've ever worked for. You know, I, I was sitting in my office at Hersham and um, a chap came in and bought the last Arbath 1000 TC. And I didn't really do a great deal to sell it. He just came in and said, may I have it, please? But it, it was quite a feat to sell it. And when Mr. Crook found out, he um, said, right, uh, follow me. And he picked me up by the lapel and dragged me along the showroom, took me into the workshop, ordered the car to be removed from the ramp. Hackett was stuck on the ramp. The ramp was raised. A, f a Union Jack flag was put in my hand and Mr. Crook ordered everybody in the workshop to clap, which they did. And I felt suitably embarrassed, <laughs> and, uh, but it was something I shall never forget. And of course the other thing with him is that 
unless it was somebody like Mr. Crook, the company wouldn't have lasted as long. It, it, it really wouldn't. It, wouldn't. It, was so, it was so dedicated and uh, so enthusiastic about everything. Um, so it was, um, it was good times. Yes, terrific memories. I mean, there was never a dull day, frankly. Um, and uh, the stories are too numerous to, to, to run through. But um, it was like being at advanced prep school in many ways. Yes. And I can remember standing very close to where we're sitting now and hearing from the office tremendous exhaust noises. Right. And I questioned my own sanity at the time, thought, can I really be hearing this? And um, I thought, well, I'd better go over and see what's happening in the chairman's office. And I opened the door to find that there was an enormous tape player in the corner. And my chairman was sitting behind a desk with crash helmet and goggles uh, and a steering wheel in his hand. And the tape was playing some recordings from a race circuit from a, a previous um, many years prior. Yes. And the, the, the late, um, oh, I can't remember his name now, um, was commentating uh, on Mr. Anthony Crook's driving. Oh, right. um, and um, it was very complimentary, you see, and uh, the noises were going on and on and on, and, and squealing of tires and things. And eventually the tape um, player was switched off. And Mr. Crook put up the goggles and said, Hackett, your chairman was driving superbly, you will clap. So I clapped. <laughs> So, in your dealings with the Bristol customers, what is it you think they appreciate about a Bristol? Because they're in a position... To be able to have anything. They can buy one of these, they can buy anything, any other British car ever correct, made. Correct, oh, correct, correct. current British car. I, I'd like to say, and I'd like to think, that it is the personal attention that we give them. I mean, the customers I've known yes. for 30, 40 years, and it, they're almost like one of the family. Yes. Because, you know, I've, I've known them for so long. Um, I don't want to drop names because no, no. it's not fair, but you know, they, we are, do become, um, we go out to dinner, um, we go to tea to the house and whatever, yes. but it's, uh, yes, it's, it's, it is charming. What does today's Bristol customer look for, would you say? What do they appreciate? Uh, a very interesting classic car yes. um, that they can thoroughly enjoy and put with their collection. Yes. And of course we make the Series 6, which is uh, an older car, which is completely rebuilt with modern engine and gearbox brakes, etc. Uh, which appeals to people that would like to use them on an everyday basis. With the Bristol, it doesn't look ostentatious. This is the beauty of it. It is, you know, such a lovely, comfortable car, but it doesn't look flash. Enormous range of customers we always have had at Bristol. I yes. mean, landed gentry, actors, clergymen, all sorts of people that, that just love the mark. Then, of course, um, Richard Branson had one as yes. well. Yes, um, what did he have? A 411 Series 5. Then, of course, there is all the partner that is associated with him at the time, who now has ev nearly every Bristol made. Right. Yeah, so, like um, indeed. Yes. Um, and I've met him a number of times. But I usually, uh, Steve O'Leary, who looks after his flock yes. of cars, which includes Aston Martins, a considerable number as well. But nearly every Bristol model he has, he has got, right. including the 450, of course. Of course. The one, the one and only. Well, yes. <clears throat> Did you deal with Peter Sellers? I dealt with his, his staff probably more than, uh, yes. than Sellers. Um, he had quite a range of cars um, which we used to look after. We used to look after uh, Liam Gallagher and 603. Um, not that he drove when he first had the car. His lady at the time, Patsy Kenzie, Patsy Kenzie. Yeah, was the one who used to drive it and she dictated the colours and you know, what the upholstery should be. 
I don't think he had a driving license to start off. He did not. When they first purchased the car, that's correct. Um, then, of course, um, there has been, obviously, people uh, with major uh, companies that, you know, I, I can't talk about too easily because I prefer no. the privacy. Having left Hersham, yes. you came to um, Chiswick Roundabout. Chiswick Roundabout, indeed. Um, and then we were there in 64 until about 72. Yes. Then from 70, we went to Alpha Laval. Yeah, which, Laval Centre, yes. Yes, which was just up the Great West Road. Then we moved to the Hogarth Centre. Yes. But by the roundabout. Again, they wanted to redevelop. And if you go past it now, it's just the same as we left it. Of course, after that, we fortunately went up to the present, which we've been now three years, I think, in Shield Drive. Yeah. No, I've got to steal though. I've, I've got to last. I've got to out uh, work Mr. Lovesy, who has been my companion and soulmate. Um, well, I mean, we speak when he was regularly with the company. It was a daily chat on the phone, and even now he's not with there. We speak weekly, definitely. Yes, yes, yes. Very fond of Mr. Lovesy. Very special person. They don't make them like that anymore, unfortunately. Morelli. Yes. Uh, thank you very much indeed. And may I compliment you <laughs> on so many years? Well, not uh, just faithful, but excellent service. I'm just hoping, Stefan, there will be more. Good. A lot more, depending on the man upstairs. We are too. We are too. So, it's very enjoyable. So, on behalf of all the Bristol owners, yes. may I say thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much.